our children's behavior often is a pinging, a signaling, hey, something's not right here. I'm, I'm not feeling oriented. And a child, you know when they do something quite provocative and then they look right at you, like, what are you gonna do about that? Understand that it's your child not being disobedient, but being disoriented. Is that we don't have to be a brilliant parent. You know, we don't have to go to the script and figure out what to say. It's just in that moment, we've, we've done a little two degree angle shift. Hello and welcome. Hey, Kim. It's good to see you. <laughs> oh, it feels like getting the band back together, Todd. I know. We uh, we had a little bit of pre-discussion here because we haven't talked face-to-face uh, -face in quite a bit. It's been a, it's been a few years, I think. You know, yeah. we've emailed back and forth. I really, really appreciate you doing this today. Oh, it's been too long. It's lovely to see you. It's good to see you. I think... Oh, gosh, I, I, I didn't plan on trying to think back to how long we've known each other, but uh, it's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> been I, met a while. You, I met you at my son's uh, school uh, when he was much younger and you were doing a talk at his school. And uh, we had heard a lot about each other, I think, um, from yeah. other people in the community. And I had read Simplicity Parenting, which is still one of my very, very favorite uh, parenting books that uh, I read from from time to time and uh, recommend to people all the time. Um, so I'm really glad we become friends and colleagues and it's so good to see you. And we're still in the vertical plane after all these years. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, fingers crossed. So when I was thinking about our conversation today and what we would talk about, I found myself reflecting upon a quote of yours that I find myself um, telling parents that I work with and friends and all the time. And that quote, I hope I get it correctly, is I've never met a disobedient child. I've only met a disoriented one. I love that quote. Um, because as I told you before, it captures something that I am trying to convey to parents I work with all the time about intention um, in, in instinct when it comes to children, that most of the time kids aren't <laughs> sitting and thinking, Hey, you know what I'll do to really frustrate my parent today? You know, they're, they're just <laughs> feeling something inside or something's going on around them and they act on their instincts. And so that quote, I've never met a disobedient child. I've only met a disoriented one just really sticks with me. And I wonder if you might talk about that and where that came from and, and just expand upon it a bit. Yeah. You know, being, I was a school counselor for a, for a long time, as well as, you know, doing parent and family work. And I've got to tell you, Todd, I've met some right little rotters. I can tell you, <laughs> <laughs> but I, nevertheless, I still couldn't, I couldn't um, look through the eyes of my heart at them and, and and say that they were being willfully disobedient. Very, very rare, very rare indeed. What I, I saw over and over is is that they were overwhelmed, and, that, and this is sort of underlying that that statement, that way of that way of looking at, at children and looking at their struggles was that they the what what disorients them is the overwhelm of too much, too soon, too sexy, too young. It's just this new normal of the overwhelming pace of life that is really affecting their nervous systems. Yeah. And they um and when they're feeling very disoriented like that, and honestly being disoriented is one of the most painful uh, emotional states a human being can be in. It's awful. It's yeah. for adults it's really, too. For adults, right? Yeah. It's really yeah. awful. And um, the uh, when kids are disoriented like that, and we, you know, and perhaps we could even say dysregulated, but it's more than just regulation. It's it's truly not not knowing and not being able to orient themselves. The little ones 
often in space. They flail about, they they bump into things, and their disorientation is more through their proprioception and not knowing where their body is in space. Right. And the um, and as well, when they're little, but also getting older, they they will often attempt to orient themselves by almost echolocating. It's almost like they've got hooking behavior. It's a little bit like fly fishing, you know, where they, 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 they out, they go and they try and reel us in, you know, yeah. because they want us to be closer. Uh, um, and I refer to this in, 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 in my books as pinging, right. but the, but not the, the tech pinging, but more than navigational pinging. Right. That uh, when a submariner, a friend of mine is a submariner actually, and and he talks to me about this pinging principle of sending out a sonic ping, and then it hits something and they it receive and they receive the bounce back from it, right. and I think that's what our children are doing. They're 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 pinging us. They're sending out behavior, and it's often it's it often reads as being. Um, aggressive or trying it on or being highly uh, disobedient. But what they're trying to do is orient themselves. And that in itself is a game changer right there. To Just understand. having that understanding. Yeah. 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 Because if we understand that, then we can look at a child and know, and if we know we're getting pinged, the first thing, there's a couple of things that happen, but the first thing is we we don't take it personally. Right. Right. We know we're getting pinged because, Todd, you know this as much as anyone. A lot of this is is being able to actually not not go down that route of dysregulation ourselves. Right. And take it personally, right? Right. Yeah. I you know, I find I I'm, I find myself uh, talking to parents about that every day, that if you interpret behavior as antagonistic or disrespectful, and that's the label you put on it, you kind of feel justified inside, even if you're not thinking that, you kind of feel justified inside as a parent in this case, to to get back at them or, you know, be antagonistic back, because you're labeling the behavior as you know, disobedient or disrespectful. And what you're saying is such a valuable you know, new way to look at it is if it's pinging, if it's mom, I'm scared, dad, I'm disoriented, I'm overwhelmed. If that's what you interpret it as, then, then you see your role as a completely different thing. You know? Yeah. And, you know, and it's interesting just on that front, Todd, that, you know, there's been more and more research uh, come out uh, based on children's mirror neurons and right. and and they're they're mirroring their ability, and it's involuntary. They don't mean it, but they pick up um, our emotional state. We know that, you know. We know yeah. that as parents. It's interesting to see the research. Like when they're little, they they can watch us like washing the dishes, and they're sitting perfectly still, but they're washing the dishes inwardly. Right. And then we hear the dragging of the stool across the floor and they're going to help. And you think, oh, my goodness, it's going to take four times longer. But they're going to. And that's the root of that's of, that's imitation. But more recent studies have found that there's these mirror neuron, uh, mirror neurons, these neural transmitters that are clustered around our, our emotional centers and the child's emotional centers. So if we know that we're getting pinged and a child, you know, when they do something quite provocative and then they look right at you, like, what are you going to do about that? Right. I hear about <laughs> that, that scenario almost every day. Yeah. 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 And, and, uh, um, and if at that point we know we're getting pinged and, and inwardly can say, I wonder what's disorienting you. I mean, don't say that out loud. That'd be weird. But just, um, <laughs> but just inwardly, <laughs> I wonder what's disorienting. Like, what is up? Are you hungry? Hmm. Are you tired? Did we just stay a little too late at that play date last night? See, this is the next stage. The first stage is is we don't take it personally. Right. But then, what happens if we know we're getting pinged? We're getting echolocated. 
is that we go into what I call the wonder of wondering. That's how I think of it. Mm. And if we wonder, I wonder what's going on for you, my grumpy little gnome. You know, like, <laughs> I, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder, I wonder. See, the wonder of wondering is that we then move ourselves actually into our limbic system and frontal lobes in our brain right. as as adults. And we get these, we send off little body messages because when we wonder i couldn't even help it when i was playing with that then i wonder we get little wonder wrinkles around our <laughs> eyes well little you might wondering. i don't i don't <laughs> we get little <laughs> and we get little we round off our shoulders a little bit it's like i wonder hmm mm. and crucially our gaze goes from that of an attack gaze mm to a soft gaze right. um, and, and if a child is being provocative and we're looking with hard eyes at them, they interpret that as an attack and they get ready with their amygdala with a fight or flight. Right. And that, Which and, again and so the, speaks to the mirror neurons and things. They're so wired to us that sometimes it's hard to yeah. distinguish whose feelings are whose, you know? And so somebody yeah. needs to take that space. The... Right. You know what I mean by this, Todd. And I'm sure many of the folk who are, who are watching and listening in to this will know what I mean by when children are being very naughty, they're actually being very vulnerable. Mm. There's, it's almost like they've decloaked, you know, they've taken off and they're very vulnerable. When a child's crying and, and even having a tantrum or a meltdown, gosh, they're vulnerable. And you know, that's so interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I get it. It resonates. Yeah, because they, they, um, um, their emotions have come to the surface. Yeah. They've, they've surfaced their emotions and, and there they are. There's no more layers. There's no layers between me and the world now. My emotional life has come to the surface. And because it has... They're watching us really carefully mm -hmm. and any little change in our body language. And we know that over 70% of our communication is body language, not, right. not, not verbal. Right. And, um, and tone and, and, and tone, yeah, tone facial and expression. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we have this wondering, if we give ourselves this, I don't know, it's really just two or three heartbeats. It's not long. It doesn't, we don't have to smudge the room and assume a certain position, lotus, like it's none of that because <laughs> it's right there. It's right, right in front of us. And they've just said something really, you know, they've said something really harsh to us um, or to their sibling or something is, you know, it's, it's not going well. Right. If we wonder what's up and we get this little wonder and our eyes go to a, a soft gaze, a softer gaze, a middle gaze, it's often called, yeah. as opposed to a piercing fixed gaze, you literally see their little bodies relax. Yeah. It's, it, and it's involuntary. This is the beautiful part of it, is that we don't have to be a brilliant parent. You know, we don't have to go to the script and figure out what to say. It's just in that moment, we've, we've done a little two degree angle shift mm -hmm. um, with uh, a dear friend of mine who's a successful business person says, you know, often when things are going wrong, we don't need a 45 degree change. We need a two degree, a mm -hmm. little, because in, 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 a, in a minute or two with that softer gaze, with the, the repair that, 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 that is needed in that moment will come much quicker. Right. The, the malleability to a situation will come much quicker. Um, and this is, I guess, the last thing, Todd, is that if we ask ourselves, I, I wonder what's going on, and nothing comes to us, like the angels do not speak, you know, nothing comes to us, it actually doesn't matter. Mm. <laughs> because right. what matters is that we've wondered, and that is entirely doable. Right. You know, the, the quote I find myself thinking about a lot um, as you're talking and when I was thinking about your book, um, this is the last one that I read. I know you've uh, done more since, but being at your best when your kids are at their worst. 
I often think, and I don't remember if the quote's in the book, um, but the quote by uh, Viktor Frankl about between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space is our ability to choose a response, and in that response is our power. I think that's the quote. If I'm, it if is. I'm doing, it's exact. Yes. Yeah, and um, and I just think about that a lot, and that's I think what you're speaking to because that's a great quote. It's an inspirational quote. You know, I've said it to a lot of people. I say it to myself to remind myself sometimes. Um, you don't have to respond. You don't have to respond so quickly. Um, you can take some space. Um, but what you're talking about is really the practical application of this. Be, yeah. be aware yeah. of taking things personally, because that's probably the where you're taking the wrong, you know, fork in the road. And then just ha- create that space between the signal, the stimulus of your child and your response and, and the wonder of wondering is, is a great way to think about that, you know, you know and that my child things, needs me to yeah, orient okay. them right now. That's what's called yeah. for. It should call out our instincts. My child needs me rather than my child's disrespecting me. Right. Oh, that's a good way to put it, you know, and, and one of the ways we can do this um, that we can kind of back it on up to when, to, to when there's, when there's situations that are just moderately, they're a little bit like a couple of brothers are not getting on a sister or brother or something's going on. One of the things that, that I find we can get into the healthy habit life is to say to kids, look, in our family, when we're all riled up, when something's going on, we, we take a minute. That's yeah. the way in our family, when we're riled up, we just give a little bit of space and that's what we uh, that's what we do and right now you know it's it's hard for you and you're upset so we're going to give it a minute we are and the child might say i don't want a minute like why do you always say and it's like because just that's what we do right it's just right. what we do and if we can cuz often in the moment like it's like oh, okay what do i do with that and if the only thing i've got to remember as a dad or a mom or a guardian is to say in our family we take a minute if that's all i've got to remember then we can regulate our own hearts we can regulate our own breathing it's a lot can happen in a minute or two you know a lot And one of the things that, you know, this is when it's getting to really kind of gold medal standard, but, and and I'm leaning into the mirror neurons again, but if in Mm. that minute we just start tidying up, Mm. see, we tidy up, how many times a day do we tidy up when kids are around, right? right? So if in that minute we start just folding some clothes from the laundry, if in that minute we just are wiping down the counter, our children are so familiar with us doing that that their mirror neurons pick it right on up Mm. and now they reset much, much more quickly because they know they're being given space. Mm. They know my mum is doing something and she does that a lot when she's at times when she's not mad, when she's not angry. She does, she folds clothes like all the time. And so everything must be good. Yeah. It, like so we kind of say, oh, we've got to be regulated ourselves. And I say, nah, just fold some clothes. <laughs> There's always some clothes to be folded. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me because the languaging I use sometimes that I don't think about a lot, but I think about when when we when we take things personally and we react to our children when there's no space between the stimulus and response, I feel like it's, we're going in on the child. We're going in and, and, and that doesn't work. You know, it's, it, as I, I like to say, it's never worked in the history of ever, you know, to, to, to go in and, and make them feel bad or direct all our energy at them. What you're describing is more of a um, broadening of the energy and leaning into what I would link to attachment language of belonging. Our yeah. family does this, right? So instead of going in on the child, you're going into a more spatial place and you're just saying, hey, this is not what we do. And so you're not personalizing with the child. You're not shaming the child. You're not making them feel bad. You're just reminding them this is what we do. And it's, such, it's so simple, but it, it's such good guidance because everyone can remember that. It might take a little practice, right? But 
just keep focusing on that, you know, fold some laundry, you know, that's not what we do, you know, and, and just keep uh, the laundry basket handy, right? Yeah, it always, <laughs> always keeps the laundry, whether it's already, you know, you had to take it out of the drawers or, you know, not. But, you know, I, having worked with addiction a lot in, in my mm. counseling uh, work, um, I think it's really important to not go away from an upset and deny it. And, and and because that is like if a child's very, very uncomfortable and there's an emotion going on and they're really disoriented, we don't want to just go away from it and deny right. it. What we're doing is giving it space right. and then circling on back to it um, where it can be worked out. There's a tendency to say, well, we're just not doing this. I'm not going to get involved in this. Right. And then a child's big emotions, they're just left kind of abandoned. Right. Um, but if they know um, that we're going to circle on back to that, when we feel a little better, we're going to circle right on back to this. And right. it could be in 10 minutes time. It could be in half an hour time. Goodness, it could be at bedtime, you know. Um, but whenever it is, we circle on back. And, and when we circle back, I know I write about this in that book, Todd, when we circle on back, I think it's really important to start the conversation with a really practical affirmation to say to a child something like, hey, Miguel, you helped bring all those tools in before it rained yesterday mm -hmm. and they didn't get rusty and you just did that. And you know, that you just made, you just did that all by yourself. And some of them were heavy. Thank you. That was really help, helpful. Right. But what just happened, you know, before with your brother, that was super unhelpful. Right. You know, and to use the word helpful, unhelpful. But to begin any kind of repair conversation, I think needs to see the heart of a child. You need to see the totality of them. It needs to, that's the beginning point saying now, Let's work out what happened because then you're triggering a kid again and they're going to fight you a little bit. Right. Well, why does she, just because she's a girl, she just, you know, and you get that, right? Right. As opposed to saying, Miguel, you know, and, and not... And not to say you are a golden gift from God. You know, don't go full <laughs> Californian on them, you know. Hey. It, it's, it's, <laughs> I resemble that it, remark. Yeah, really. <laughs> um, but it's, um, but to just perfectly practically prep the conversation with a, it's almost a little bit like, um, I think I've mentioned this before to you, Todd, when I was working in, I was working actually with attachment stuff mm -hmm. uh, in, in Southern Africa mm. stuff with this deep, you know, work in attachment. Because yeah. during the AIDS epidemic, mothers and fathers would tragically die of children and they would default to their uncle. And then the uncle and aunt would die and they default to the second. And so there were children with such attachment strains mm -hmm. uh, because they were being raised in groups of 20 or 30 kids. I mean, it was really, I um, did really lean into my earlier work with John John Bowlby and, uh, you know, and I, I, gosh, that came up strongly uh, yeah. for me when I was doing that. But when I, anyway, when I, when I was in Southern Africa, just a small part of a much larger team, people would greet each other in the Zulu language. They would say, Subanu, Subanu, and you'd hear it all over in the marketplaces in the morning, Subanu, which means I see you. And then the refrain is Ngohona, and Ngohona means, so now I am here. Wow. And and when we sit down with a child and we say, Miguel, you brought that shopping in and in the biggest, heaviest bag, it was kind of almost as big as you, my love. And you brought that in from the car for your mum. Thank you. That was so helpful. That was so helpful this morning. But something has gone really wrong. That is Subanu Mohona. It's saying, I see you. And then a child can feel, so now I can be here. Because they're not right. getting, what did you say, Todd? They're not, I thought of a javelin. They're not getting, what was the word you use when you come at them? Oh, going you, in is the going language. In. Like going in on the child rather than, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's, uh, that's mirroring, spine. right? What, you're, what yeah. you're talking about in the psychological language is just mirroring. And mirroring doesn't have to be positive affirmation all the time. It, it can be, but mirroring is also reflecting back frustration, reflecting back 
disorientation and a child can feel seen and feel, you know, understood if you mirror any of their emotions. And that's, that's what comes up for me. With young children, and you might've noticed, I kind of chose my words carefully, is that with young children, it's something must have really gone wrong. Right. And let's see if we can put it right and then move right. on. Which doesn't now, personalize three, it. There's a three parts to this because I find in, in North American culture and in many Western cultures, we over talk it with kids mm -hmm. and they like, oh no, I'm going to have to talk about my feelings. <laughs> You know, it's that kind of thing, yeah. as opposed to saying, hey, you know, um, Skylar, something must have gone really wrong for, for you to snatch that away from your brother like that or to have said that. Something must have gone wrong. And let's see if we can put it right, second one, so we can move on. Because right. then our children don't feel corralled. They don't feel painted into a corner. Right. Um, something went wrong. Not what are you feeling? How are you like? I, I find that children much younger than 12 before the brain, before the, the, the traffic starts uh, um, moving between the corpus callosum from right to left brain, cause and effect, subtle emotional understandings. If we look at little children and say, now, what are, you, what are you feeling? Let's talk about your feelings. And then we look at them like they should know. It actually disconnects us. That's almost like, a, like an unraveling of attachment. Right. Because we're looking at them, they should know. And they actually don't. Right. So to say <laughs> something like, to ground it in the practical, something must have gone wrong. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out, did it? Something must not have worked out. A child can completely often, very often relate to that went wrong. And he might say, well, yeah, he goes into my room and takes my baseball mitt and I didn't even say he could do it. And it's the one grandpa gave me and he like left it in the rain. And there's this whole story, right? right? And it's about the baseball mitt. It's not about I felt trespassed and all that right. fancy stuff. And so if you can go with that went right so we can move on like right. so we can just put this right and then move on and, and some kids sometimes will say like move on like really quickly mm -hmm. and i say yeah <laughs> but we need to put it right. right and then yeah 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 we can move we can move it's, on it's offering orientation it's offering guidance and yeah. okay this is where we can go you know which yep. is what they need because a lot of times they're just in a state of i don't know how to get out of this and so you're offering them that path that's a really good point though, Tom, because that's that's dealing as you said with the disorientation mm -hmm. like it so many roads lead back to orienting a child knowing they're disorienting or disoriented and and orienting them through statements like in our family we take a minute right. through something must have gone wrong right. i wonder how we can put that right and move on these are all in a sense they're forward looking they're saying we're sitting here in the now we're not denying it but we're we're doing this so we can move forward because children <laughs> they've only recently come into this world their job is to move, is to mm -hmm. move on. They're not mm -hmm. old people like me who who reflect back, you know, who are reflecting on their behavior. I can do that um, because I'm an old guy, but little kids, they don't want to do that. They, they want to move on, right? And right. we're speaking their language because that's their orientation point. Yeah. Such a good point. So as we wind up here, Kim, this has all been such great information, but why don't we review kind of the steps that you're you're outlining here? So as I understand it and help me out is at first it's to recognize that we're being pinged, you know, and, and when you were saying that I was thinking about like bats and sonar, right? They, they can tell <laughs> where the walls are. You might have even said this in one of your books. They can tell where things are in the darkness by sending out sonar signals that bounce back and then they can tell where they are, right? So the first thing to do is recognize, like I tell my parents, is that our children's behavior often is a pinging, a signaling, hey, something's not right here. I'm, I'm not feeling oriented. And then the second thing to do is just to realize, take a breath and don't take it personally. Understand that it's pinging. 
understand that it's your child not being disobedient, but being disoriented. And then maybe try to find that space of the wonder of wonder, right? Of like, hmm, I wonder what's going on. And like you said, it's not necessarily that important that you figure that out. Like sometimes you will. You go, oh yeah, the child's been in the car for for hours and hasn't eaten that much today and hasn't got energy out. Like it'll be obvious, but whether it's obvious or not, it's just to create that pause point by having the wonder, right? The, am I getting this right so far? Absolutely. Yes, right. that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. And then leaning into family-oriented language and orienting language of hey, in our family, this is not what we do. Let's figure this out so we can move on. Do, am I getting this correctly? Because yeah, let's we, we, have a, a we have so many parallels in how we think of this, but you use different languaging. And so when you're speaking like, ooh, that's better languaging. Ooh, I love that languaging. But that's a good summary, you would say? Yeah, you know, and to say, uh, also just to say in our family, you know what, we try, we try really hard to, to not treat each other like that. Right. Because if we say to a child in our family, we don't, and they just did. <laughs> right. It can make them feel right. Now they're outside of our village. Right. So yeah, in our family, we try really hard to not do that. And you know, what we do do is that we take a minute when, when we're upset, we take a minute. Yeah. Right. That, that, that's an important step. Yeah. That's a great distinction too. Hmm. Well, Kim, thank you so much for doing this. I always enjoy uh, speaking with you. I hope we get an opportunity to uh, do it in person sometime soon and go out for one of those uh, Chinese food dinners here in town uh, that we've done in the past. And uh, thank you just so much. And I, I really recommend to people, uh, I'm sure a lot of people watching this know your work, um, but um, for people who are new to Kim's work, Please check out Simplicity Parenting. Please check out The Soul of Discipline. And uh, one of the hottest topics with parents I talk to, how to be at your best when your kids are at their worst, which, by the way, is just a, a remarkable title. And I'm jealous that you uh, you came up with that title. That's such a, a great <laughs> encapsulation um, um, for parents. But Kim, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it's such it's such a pleasure, Todd. And I'm going to tell my editor that you really like that title because she said it's too long. So I'm going to go tell her. <laughs> it's perfect. You go <laughs> Thanks, tell her Todd. what's what. Thanks, Kim. Bye. <laughs>